<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to WXP Live. Excuse us while we uh, plug in all the necessary uh, cables. But uh, welcome. My name is uh, Braden French. I'm the host, production team, cleaner, uh, design team, and promotions expert for Work Experience Podcast. And tonight, we're trialing something new. We are being part of this uh, technology, technological age, and we are bringing the conversation to you, and we are welcoming your input. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guests, and they are all going to appear at exactly the same time. Welcome, friends. You are now uh, all live, all beaming into all corners of the globe. Um, Carissa, Richard, and Molk, welcome to WXP Live. Hey. Hey, hi. Molk, say something so we know the tech works. I'm kidding. It's great to see everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Good. He's the joker. We know. Okay, we've established the roles. Um, look, people are already watching. That's great. Um, tonight we're going to um, have a bit of fun. As is part of the podcast tradition, we're going to play lit or quit later. We're also going to we're going to have an expanded library. Each one of our guests is going to um, share a, a book. Um, I assume a book or something um, that they've found useful. And we're also going to ask some questions and you, the viewers, can be part of this. That's what's so exciting. Uh, through your Facebook comments, um, through messaging the page. Here we go. Oh, yeah, people are already there. Hi, Will. Hi, Hannah. Thank you for your uh, comments. Uh, let us know if you're there and, and where you're listening from. Um, but if you have questions for these guys, either individually or as a panel, or if there are things that you would like to be added to our game of lit or quit, as Malt rightly says, it's the people's game. Um, you can add that in the comments and we'll, we'll get to that later in the show. We're going to be here for about an hour. Um, if you have any influence or any friends and you want to share this live feed via Facebook, <laughs> um, that would be great. The more the merrier. Um, everyone's welcome to join us. We're going to rip into these. Uh, issues. But first, I thought what we would do is I'm going to invite each of our guests to take some time to tell us uh, who they are, maybe um, their context, where they're in ministry or working and living, and a little bit about their story. So then when we move into the questions, we know um, the, the wisdom behind our discussion. So um, being um, the unofficial princess of Tonga, I'm going to invite Carissa, to uh, introduce yourself first, and um, and then we'll move across the screen. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carissa Suli, and I'm a second-generation Tongan Australian. I'm married um, to this beautiful man named Lungi, and we celebrated 20 years of marriage last month. I am also a mother of four children. Uh, my I've got two adult children. Uh, the oldest is 20. I have an 18 year old, a 12 year old, and also a 14 month year old son. Um, I was born in Manly, but grew up in New Zealand and of Tongan descent. So, you know, it's up to you who you think I am. I, I don't have any identity issues, lol. Um, I am also a minister of the word for the Uniting Church, um, and I, in, in my second placement, working for the National Assembly Office. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else I could add there, Brayden. No, that's great. Excellent. Um, welcome, Chris. I thank you for uh, joining us on the very first WXP Live. Uh, Richard, we're going to throw to you, mate. Yeah. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm uh, Richard Leroy. Um, I live in Sydney. Um, I've been part of the Uniting Church all my life. I'm probably a bit of a Uniting Church nerd. Uh, love, love our church and love being on committees and 
find myself on lots of committees and things. Um, I, I'm a pastor and I work as chaplain at New Inton College, which is one of our Uniting Church schools here in um, Sydney. And so I minister to um, young people from kindergarten to year 12, five years old to 18. Um, yeah, I'm family. Um, my parents are originally from Sri Lanka, so I've got a Sri Lankan background, but uh, born and bred here in Australia. That's probably enough. All right. Thanks, Richard. And thank you for joining us. Um, and Malk, you are on my far right of screen, I think. But you might be on the far left. Uh, we won't. We'll find that out as the evening goes on. But Malk, do you want to tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Thanks, Braden. My name is Steve Malkinton. I work in the sunny climes of Queensland um, for the Queensland Synod of the Uniting Church. I'm the mission officer focusing on Generation Next, so primarily youth and young adults, um, and broadly just working with people who are passionate uh, about you know, people under 35 in the church. That kind of works for me. Uh, I am the whitest person on this panel, um, given that you're unofficially a Tongan anyway, Brayden. Um, so, yeah. hi. Um, I love Lego. I love Star Wars. Uh, I love my family. Uh, and I love um, just being connected to both people who are passionate about supporting and encouraging young people in ministry and connecting them uh, through to Jesus, as much as I am in working with the young people themselves who are dedicated and passionate. And uh, it, it's just a, something that consistently uh, puts me in a position of awe, Braden, working with young adults and young people who love Jesus and want to tell their friends about him. Awesome. Welcome, Malt. Um, it was taught, I think it was tautology, you both saying that you love, that you're a you're the widest person here and that you love Star Wars and Lego. I think uh, one of those... <laughs> Unnecessary, really, been, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, one of those would have covered both. Um, friends, welcome. Uh, audience, uh, welcome. These are, um, these are great quality uh, people. It is a privilege um, to uh, be hosting this. Um, I found out just now that I can, I can publish Facebook comments on the screen. So um, it's like q and A, really. It's um, if you want your moment of fame, type oh, something no. in the comments. I will throw it up there. Um, my wife gave me a wave, so I will publish that because she's <laughs> sent me her laptop. Um, Just remember, Braden, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> yes, and I've shown a utter disregard for that my whole ministry life. <laughs> uh, okay, friends, um, what we have here, um, we, we, the podcast. Uh, work Experience Podcast seeks to explore the relationship between the church and today's young people. And that's mm -hmm. going to be really the focus of our conversation. Um, but I'm also going to let us riff off uh, what we hear from each other. And if there are questions or comments in the Facebook chat, um, we'll, we'll, I'm really happy to ask them as well. So, I think I want to start with a really generic and quite easy question. And uh, whoever wants to jump in first, uh, you're very welcome. What is good news for today's young people? Like, the gospel is good news, but what is that for today's young people? From your experience, it's not a, it's not a test, um, but I think this is a question that the church really needs to grapple with. So I'm inviting... Uh, from your wisdom and experience, uh, you might want to share. Ladies first, or um, what is well? You know, the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask the question, "What is good news for young people?" For me, it's uh, when they get a job, <laughs> when they get money, when food is ready, <laughs> um, and when there are great achievements that they accomplish or even in the family but when we talk about the gospel and how the good how that is good news for them for me they hear that as they belong just as they are they are not judged they are not shunned uh, by a god who loves them unconditionally um so i believe that when young people hear the good news of our lord jesus christ they are reminded again and again and again 
that God truly does love them um, just as they are, which I think can be quite overwhelming for the young people to think that what you mean just as I am, I am accepted, I am worthy. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that I totally resonate with that exactly. That, you know, we the good news of the gospel is that God comes to all of us and to young people, yeah, just as they are. And I think that's what we as the church can offer as well, is to be the people that come and say, we love you and you are loved and you are accepted no matter what, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are. God loves you and we love you. I think that's powerful, particularly in the 21st century for young people. And, and a church that's willing to take them seriously in that. Yes. Uh, and not minimise them and not suggest that, you know, it's only when they grow up, it's only when they mature, it's only when something, something, condition, condition. Um, but a church that right now says your voice and your experience of God and um, the way that you are being formed is vital to who we are. And just as we need the saints, just as we need the, the older people who have spent years in faith, or even the older people who are new to faith, we need young people uh, who are going to help us recognize um, how we understand God uh, and what it means to be at work in the world around us. We are off and running. Thanks, friends. Um, so much in that. and. Uh, we will, I think we'll find that our conversation is a little circular, um, but we're off and running. And if you're uh, just joining us, welcome. Uh, hopefully you can read the names of the people uh, on our panel this evening. Uh, exceptional, exceptional friends and colleagues. But we already have a question. And uh, so we're going to get into that. Uh, okay. Nicole, Nicole okay. Mumford has a question for Richard. So, uh, Malk and Carissa, you can have dinner. Malk, you, can check, you can check on Survivor if you want. I'll try putting it on the screen. Oh, it is on the screen. There we are. Uh, I'll read it, though. Um, Nicole asked Richard, I'm wondering what role should chaplaincy in schools and university play in connecting with church? I feel like often chaplaincy is put on one side and uh, the focus of the church is ministry... Uh, oh, so it's put to the side, and the focus of the church is ministry to young people within the church. How should the church engage with the ministry of chaplaincy? Uh, thank you, Nicole. And, and I would also add that sometimes yeah. I feel like uh, people expect chaplaincy is like a recruitment tool. We're going to send you to the mm. school so that you will bring uh, people to church. So, uh, Richard, remind us of your context, and then um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Nicole's yeah. question. Thanks, Nicole, that's an um, yeah, awesome question. So I'm currently um, a school chaplain, so I'm ministering to um, kids from five years old to, 12, to year 12 to 18. Um, but before that, I was a uni chaplain. So I've been in this chaplaincy space for uh, quite a while. Um, and I think it's really important because, yeah, you're right, sometimes um, chaplaincy ministries get pushed to the side and yeah, get, seen as a add-on to our regular church. Um, I think it's one of the best ways that we can give this good news to young people today. Um, you know, we hear, which I don't believe, but we hear, oh, there's no young people in the church. Um, but there's young people in these schools. There's young people in these universities. And so this is a chance that we can give this good news and say that we, the church cares about you and that you're loved and welcomed and you have a role to play and you're valued. Um, I think that it's a really important space. I mean, I connect with hundreds of kids every, every week. Um, surely that's got to be a place where we can, um, we can celebrate and we can, we can use to bring the church to. Now it's, as Brayden said, it's not real. It shouldn't be seen as a place to yeah, connect them from the schools into our church. Um, but I think it's a way of exposing them to faith and a way of showing them what faith looks like um, and how, what we, who we as the church are, because I think the church is, for many of these, many young people, completely foreign to them. And so it's a way of saying, hey, we're, this is just what we, we're about. 
um, and a way of showing this good news that you're loved and cared for and you, they have a place to, a role to play. Thank can you, I ask Richard. Richard a second question on that, Braden? Yeah. Well, yeah, of course, as long as I can make the, um, the thing work. Yeah, there you go, there you are. All right, there we go. Now I feel like I can ask it properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Richard, I guess by extension then, from what you said, how can we uh, encourage church to take school chaplaincy specifically? Because we do hospital chaplaincy yeah. really, really great. How can we encourage uh, the Uniting Church to take school chaplaincy seriously as a means of reaching a bunch of young people, engaging them in conversation and ministry and a whole bunch of other stuff? I think it's it's starting to it's an attempt to change that idea that schools chaplaincy is a tack on or is off to the side. I mean, in New South Wales alone, we're in schools we've got we're almost ministering to more than ten thousand young people every week. Surely that should be somewhere that we're valued mm. and um, a ministry that's valued part of the church. I'm not saying that it's not, but I think you know, yeah. Um, embracing it and seeing ways that we can connect, um, connect local churches in with um, what's happening in the schools. Not so that, you know, it's, it come, you know, it feeds one to the other and may do that, but um, building on connections between different parts of the school, between different parts of the church, between congregations, agencies, schools, all of those things. Do you think that part of that is because, uh, particularly at, um, I guess, a synod layer, because that's where the church interfaces with schools mm -hmm. most directly, that because schools are a unique and, and almost independent function of the church, yeah. that we let them go and do their own thing and let that happen. And they know because they're church schools that they need chaplains, but that they're not then sure how to re-engage other than going, we've got schools. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's um, a problem. I don't I, I don't think we've worked out in the Uniting Church where the schools exactly fit into into the bigger puzzle of of our church, be it a synod puzzle or a national assembly puzzle. I don't think we've worked that out. Um, but I think it's it it starts by building connections and it starts by um, connecting dots between those various places. Um, so that we know what everyone else is doing and then we can know ways that we can support each other. Yeah. That's really timely advice for me, yeah. if nothing else, Richard, because we're uh, really starting to um, build those connections through the schools commission and, and you know, the yeah. formal methods through into our schools. Uh, and for someone like me who wants to encourage and engage with school chaplains and the people who are involved in ministry, that's really important. Thanks, man. Yeah. And I think it, it also goes more than just between within a synod it goes between synods you know i know there's awesome stuff that's happening in other synods in schools but you know we don't connect that well or other you know it's building connections and i think that's part of the problem across the church um not just in a school's chaplaincy area um ways that we can support yeah. each other rather than siloing the work that we're doing mm. all right um thank you richard uh Nicole's asked some follow-up questions. We might circle around there because I think the question around KPIs and measurable outcomes and stuff will also factor into some of the other questions we I have later around the professionalization of youth ministry and what that's done within the context of congregations. Uh, now, one of the things everyone loves about Work Experience Podcast is my ability to use creative and high quality sound effects. Uh, due to copyright issues, we couldn't embed them in our live stream tonight, but I have my trusty kazoo, and so I will be providing sound effects um, for our regular sections. And Carissa, um, I'm going to invite you. You just had that last question off, um, and really most of our audience is here to hear from you. Um, so after the um, – everyone knows it's true um, – after the introduction – would you care to share your library book with us, please? Sure. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so my library book, um, I'm sharing Ways of God's Embrace. And this is a book by uh, Winston Halabor, and he writes about the sacred perspectives from the ocean 
um, and shares insight from how people of Polynesia um, relate to the ocean. But what I love about this book is that he shares his theological perspectives on what the fala means for us Pacific Island people. And how, and for those of you who don't know what a fala is, a fala is a woven mat. Um, but I love how he connects the fala to the gospel and brings out different themes of hospitality, um, equality, um, and also God's love through the short book um, that also connects to the ocean and what the water means for us people from Polynesia. So the um, so yeah that's my book from my library excellent thank you uh carissa for that we're gonna um hear from uh everyone their library books and uh as is our practice the details of the book will i'll post that on the work experience facebook page over the coming week uh, where you can yep. buy them um Awesome. And uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, great start. Great start. Um, okay. Uh, welcome to new viewers, those waving to us. Um, shameless attempts to get uh, featured on the screen. Um, that that works. Like Ellie Aaliyah sent us an emoji. I'll happily include that because uh, we're not above that here. Um, we're the people show. So... Um, you know, oh you're very welcome. Uh, Liwana Palu sent a crying, laughing emoji, albeit 15 minutes ago, so she's checked out. But, um, you know, <laughs> we'll, everyone's welcome to play a part. Uh, the other thing is that later we will be playing Lit or Quit, and uh, we will do our very best to tell you who won Survivor. Um, unless, of course, you would rather not know that or if you're from Adelaide or Perth and you've got to wait two or three days, um, then, you know, we won't spoil that. But uh, Suzanne Stanton sends us a wave. Hello, Suzanne. Um, welcome. Um, it's lovely to have you along for the, for, the, for the ride. The good thing about that is you could join, watch, wave, leave, and nobody knows. It's like... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's like being in synod ministry. Everyone just assumes you're doing something. Okay, <laughs> we're going to ask the next question. Um, okay, all of us are working in um, distinctive uniting church contexts um, and, and have experience beyond our current placement. I think that's fair to say. So... Uh, and we're going to start with you, Molk, and we're going to walk, um, and then we're going to open up to whoever. What would you say is the current challenges facing the Uniting Church regarding ministry with young people and emerging generations? And we'll start with one each, and we'll see where we get to. Oh man, um, like I have a list, right? How do you keep me on one? That's tough. I'm going to say that I without trying to raise any kind of controversy, one of the difficult things that I'm seeing or challenges that I'm seeing in ministry with emerging generations is how they are processing and dealing with some of the same gender marriage stuff um, after the assembly decision. And broadly, this is a very, very generalized statement. They're doing okay with it. It's how they're processing their parents um, the older people that they look to and trust and, and see as guides and their ministers and how they're processing it that is causing them some pain uh, because then either directly or by proxy, that's affecting them uh, and, and how that continues. And because they might think they've got it worked out and then see people that they trust who are struggling with it or feeling pain or anxiety or fear or, or whatever in the process and then... That makes them second guess how they're feeling. Should I be feeling like this? Am I allowed to think this thing that I'm thinking when other people are thinking different things to me? It's it's that's huge. Thanks, Malk. Um, who wants to go next or respond? Uh, I'll, uh, or respond. I, I I'll respond and then go next. 
Um, yeah, I do agree with Volk. I know particularly in cold communities, um, it's not talked about because it's a taboo topic. Um, and you can only push the young people so far or the leaders that the young people, um, or I guess the leaders of the churches that the young people go to. But I do recognise too that within the cold communities, there are uh, young people who are accepting of it. It's not an issue, particularly the decision that the United Church has made, but there are those who are still struggling to understand theologically what does this mean for them when all yeah. they've ever known is marriages between man and woman. And it's not that they don't it's not that they don't accept, you know, marriage between two people. It's just trying to now think theologically different. Um so that's an ongoing struggle and tension within um, some of the cold communities. But but I must say, overall, I, my sense is that there are young people who are accepting and, and just want to move on, and they really don't want to engage in that conversation. <laughs> there are other more. There are other things that need to be talked about. Yeah, great response. Uh, so like my response. Yeah. Oh no! Did you want to go? Did you want to say anything, Richard? Before I no, I put think in I, my. That's good. That's all good. Uh, so for me, uh, current challenges for young people in the United Church, I feel personally that there is no clear pathway for our young people, our youth and young adults, if they wanted to explore what their call to ministry is, or even not, even just beyond a call to ministry. You know, I, I mean, Braden would know, know this, I harp on this a lot with him. I feel like that a, a lot of young people have come across um, they think that ordained, they think that the only pathway that they know is ordained ministry. Um, and I feel like as a church, we need to begin to think about what other pathways are there for our youth and young adults to offer their leadership beyond the local church, mm. within the local church. Um, how do we begin to start talking about vocation and not just call? Because call is just is not just for the ordained. You know, mm. a call from God is for all people. But for some reason over the years, we've made call just for the ordained. Um, so I feel that that is challenging for our young people when we are not talking about how they can live fruitful lives as cleaners or receptionists or doctors or lawyers or whatever it, it may be. Um, and I feel like we as a church can actually help them explore their vocation and how they can live as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ not just in the box of ordained ministry. And I'm saying that as an ordained minister too. So that, that's a challenge for us youth and young adults, particularly when in the church we've taken out our youth workers. I'm not sure how many theological colleges are talking, are teaching youth ministry or anything in that realm. Um, so well, that's Braden a challenge said. for us as a church. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> And and I you're spot on, Carissa. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry to jump in on that. I, I agree. I think that we need to really think about what it call, what what it looks like to be called into vocational ministry and how we process that, how we support that, how we form uh, people up to be engaged in that, particularly our young people. And whether there's concepts of bivocational ministry, um, engagement in community ministry, what it looks like to be people who are, if I'm going to use an old school phrase, just tending the flock versus trying to find some new sheep okay uh, yeah, I mean, now that... richard no rich i'm interrupting um i'm going all um hosty <laughs> on you um because uh there's there's the oh how do i get my finger in the shot i don't know um we've got some questions in the comments um that we want to riff off that but then richard we will come back to you and um but hannah reeve asks the following question great point carissa i told you uh, everyone's here uh, to listen to the Fifer Cow. <laughs> uh, how do we encourage the wider church to tap into the gifts and call of young adults in particular? Sometimes it feels like young adults are treated like older youth, when in fact, yeah, that's right. accountants, electricians, musicians, engineers, tend to get a panelist's thoughts. Uh, I would also add, because I can, because I'm the host, and I think Hannah would agree with me, that uh, we also struggle to um, understand young adults that actually don't want to be youth leaders, like mm. that just want to be yeah. part of the gathered community without having to take on a leadership role because they don't see that as their calling. 
Um, so thank you, Hannah, for your question. Samissi has also asked a great question, and we will get to that um, after Richard's had his chance to rant on challenges. Um, but it's an excellent question, and we will get to that. But if we can respond, I think, to uh, Hannah's comment uh, briefly, I think that would be great. Mm. Hannah's spot on. I'd encourage a wider church. Yeah, yeah. that's a great she's question. Nailed it. That's exactly yeah. an issue that our young adults face. Because we have, and I've ranted about this before, I'm sorry, I'll dive in. Um, the fact that we have young people who run teams of people around the country, around the world, that hold millions of dollars in budgetary stuff that make things that large vehicles have to drive over and they can't even get a physical key to the church. Like, these are people who are extremely capable and incredibly talented. And you're right, Brayden, not all of them want to be youth leaders. Um, and we need to find the ways that we can engage them in the life of the church that is really just doubling down on the things that God has gifted them in to bless us with as much as extend his kingdom. Uh, and how we do that, we just got to start doing some elbowing. We got to make some room. We got to get some people to listen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Mulk. And part of it for me, I believe, is that the wider church, you know, local church, like all councils of the church need to begin to um, obviously think differently. We actually need to give space. You know, we talk about, you know, encouraging our next generation, but how much space are we giving them to say, hey, you know, the invitation, I think it's also about invitation, inviting them into these spaces, not to come and say, hey, listen to me, you know, look what I can teach you, but actually inviting them to offer, you know, their gifts and skills to help, you know, grow the mission of God um, in whatever context we're all working in. So for me, it is about encouraging the wider church to encourage and to invite, sorry, I think it's a key thing. Also, I think it's also about, you um, some education around helping the church understand that although us as a church have not changed or our structures have not changed, we are living in a changing landscape. Nope, oh, we've lost your audio. She'll come back. Just She'll keep come back. <laughs> yep. We've frozen. Um, but yeah. Can I go off that invite point? Yes. 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 Please do that, and um, we'll get we'll send some um, we'll send the Very NBN good. over to Oatly to get Carissa back on deck. Because that's I think that was what I was going. Which riffs riffs off this point. What I was going to say is I think the problem is for young people is finding their place in the church, or the church finding a place for the young people in the church. Um, and I think one of the big problems is that often young people aren't invited into the space, yet they're out there, as Malk said, trusted in their corporate lives or their working lives with massive things, but the church doesn't trust them in the same way. And I say this as a young person, as well as a person ministering to young people. Um, have, you know, I've sat in places where people have talked about, oh, how do we minister to young people? And there's been two or three of us who are young and ministering to young people and we haven't been included in the conversation. And so I think that's part of the problem is that um, we as the Uniting Church need to work out ways that we can um, realistically and genuinely um, invite younger Back. people, young adults into the conversation of our church and value them for what they, are, what they have to say. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, sorry, I, Carissa, but sorry. you can yeah. uh, finish, finish where you were. I, I, can't, I can't remember where I finished. Um, I, I mean, I, I did speak about inviting, you know, having mm -hmm. some education about helping the church understand the changing landscape that we're living in. That's where um, you dropped out. Yes, that's where I dropped out. Okay. So that changing landscape, you know, is reminding the church at all levels or at all councils that, um, the world that we live in is changing rapidly, so we need to begin to make some changes to give space and invite, you know, this next generation or the current generation that is in the church. But I think those who are in leadership roles, first gen, 
need to also take risks and invest with the these young adults that are in our spaces. Preach, sister. Preach. You know? So for me, like I'm a prime example of a first gen investing time and effort and taking a risk and saying, hey, we see something in you, so come and lead the Thai National Conference second gen and see what grows out of that. But I had ongoing mentorship, and I believe that mm. ongoing mentorship needs to happen alongside. It's not just saying, hey, yeah, we've got young people, dump them and let them yep. swim or drown, but actually having that ongoing mentorship um, alongside them. So, yeah, that's my spill. Mm. I think awesome. mentor, mentorship is one of the key things um, because, you know, as a young person as well as, you know, we need support. Can't just do it yeah. alone. And I think we've got to learn from um, what's gone before and young people have to learn um, from our elders of our church. Um, yes. Definitely. All right. Um, welcome to those uh, those joining in the um the stream and uh remember you can drop a comment you can um give us a some love emojis we always love that and we will shamelessly include your comments on the screen um joy han um has joined us um reminding us it's it's a great <laughs> q a quote here um some good use of hashtags and emojis uh welcome joy um nice. don't forget you can ask questions um as well and but uh, we're currently mid-cycle of a question um, that I think Richard gets to answer around current challenges facing the Uniting Church for young people. Uh, Richard, do you want to um, respond to that question? And then we uh, will get on to one of the questions down in our comment section. Yeah, and I've kind of, I think we've cycled around a little bit. It's finding finding a way that young people can um, properly fit into the work of the church. Um, you know, that means contributing, uh, ways that they can, young people can contribute to the life of a congregation or a agency or a, you know, presbytery synod or assembly. Um, but I think young people are also trying to find that out as well. So I think it's for the church, the church is trying to work out ways that we can that young people can fit in. But I think young people are also struggling with that. Um, yeah, understanding their place in the church. And I think it comes back back to that, um, you know, what Carissa was saying that, you know, to serve the church, there's a perception that, yeah, you have to go into ordained ministry. Um, but that doesn't work for around, for most people, really. Yeah. And so it's a question of what, how can we as the church properly embrace what young people have to offer and not tokenistically but actually include yeah. them in in the process um yeah yeah there's a real challenge in that for us though richard and that's because most of our structures as a church yeah. are set up to focus on and to support ordained ministry yes. and to get behind that and to not that it's not valuable please don't misunderstand mm. that mm. i think incredible the people that um, hear a call of God and, and commit their lives in this amazing way to being engaged in developing people and God. Um, however, we need to strip back some of the layers around that, yeah. still valuing them while finding those opportunities to engage other people, particularly yeah. young people, in that um, uh, vocational ministry context and find out ways maybe to train them on the job or engage in that kind of process um, because they're I see an element where at times people who are engaged in particularly youth ministry because there's no formal qualification for that now within the life of the Uniting Church, even though they may be in a placement role, you're not a minister. Mm. That's tough, right? That's tough to work in and to be a part of that. Yep. Mm. Yep. yep. Great. Excellent. Um, thanks, friends. Uh, we are oh here we are oh say no to tokenism thank you Hannah. Yeah. Thank you. um yeah and rachel anderson welcome rachel frustrating and isolating for lay and volunteers uh mm. 
Deidre Palmer, a friend of ours, and I think she, I think keep an eye on Deidre. She's gonna, she's gonna go places. Go places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she talks about the clericalization of laity, and you know, I didn't make that up because that's a lot of big words. But uh, she sees that as a real um, unfortunate um, path that we've we've gone down as a church. That we we we've lost our understanding of the laity. Um, mm. All right, now now we do need to circle back. Um, by the way, I haven't concentrated this much for a work thing for a good <laughs> five years. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, here, we, here we are. We're going back. Here's the question from Samissi, who's watching us uh, on a phone and has forgotten the charger, so he may not get to hear it, but um, <laughs> that's fine. Samissi uh, asks, how should we interact with young people who have turned away from church because they don't believe in Jesus uh, and God, but believe in believing a Jesus-like sort of way of life, albeit accidentally? What if young people turned away from church they don't believe in Jesus and God, but believe? Well, I believe that young people, or just people in general who have turned away, can we put the question back up again? Uh, I, uh, oh, is it gone? I can, I no, 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 it. no, it's there, it's there, you just... Um, Can you go in front of me? There you are, can you... Just I had to know. find it. Yeah, that's right. There you it, go. It was, it was um, 18 minutes ago. I, I, so, how, how should we interpret for young... So, for young people who have turned away from the church, or for me, I personally believe people in, generally, in general, I believe they don't believe in religion, but I believe they believe that in a spiritual, they have some kind of spirituality. Mm. Um, so for me, I would still interact with them the way I interact with every other person. I don't believe that the way I, in, I interact with Christians, you know, or to faith believers is different to the way I interact with non-believers. Because I believe us as Christians, you know, have something to offer even those who have turned away. Um, and that is the love and the grace and the hope. And it's not about going out and Bible bashing them, but just engaging with them as normal people, making simple connections just like Jesus did, right? You know, you think about the story about the woman at the well. Jesus' connection with her was, I am thirsty. Can I have a drink? <laughs> so for me, it's about continuing simple connections, um, and being willing to listen regardless whether they go to church or not. But, yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you, Carissa. A survivor update. Um, uh, Shane and... No, Sam... no, I don't want to go. Oh, take your earbuds out. <laughs> take it off. Shane and Sean are our final two, and they're doing something called the pitch, <laughs> which I, I don't think has anything to do with baseball. Um, and, and yeah, you can put it back in there, Mulk. Um, All right. We need to respect that Mulk watches 36 hours of TV every day and um, <laughs> is one of Australia's TV gurus. And to be missing uh, the episode of one of the trashier reality TV shows to join us here is a sacrifice um, that I want to honour and uh, give thanks for. Uh, I see that Samissi so was on 1% uh, three minutes ago, so he's gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> too much, too much Angry Birds. Uh, and Suzanne <laughs> asked a great question, and we're going to get to that question right after we jump back into the library. And this time, Steve Mulkinton is going to talk to us about his library book right after the sound effect. <laughs> That is honestly the worst. Um, the book that I'm reading, and here it isn't, um, is not a physical book, but a, a, a digital copy, because that's the space oh, that God. I live in. Um, but it's a book by John Ronson, So You've Been Publicly Shamed. And it speaks, um, mate, it tells some amazing stories. Um, primarily, it's focused on the changing nature of how we connect via social media particularly, but certainly in digital and, and those kinds of contexts and how this old sesh, uh, this old fashioned sense of justice has been replaced by what can only be called a digital mob rule. And he uses some great examples to talk about people who um, 
look, at best made some mistakes and at worst said some pretty horrid things or posted some pretty, you know, uh, ugly things uh, in their uh, social media feeds that then caused a whole bunch of other people to just cast judgment on them uh, in a huge way, like just ready to lay down some stones and even chucking them, you know, change these people's lives. Uh, and in it, Ronson ponders the concept that, you know, we have taken on this onerous responsibility of being judge, jury and executioner uh, in a digital context, thinking that there has very little real implication to it when actually we affect people's lives with every interaction, with the way that we continue to engage with each other, the things that we say we love and particularly the things and the people and the things that they say that we hate. Um, it's a torrid read. There's lots of naughty words in it. If you uh, have issues around sort of some four letter swearing, then maybe this isn't the book for you. However, it is very real. It's not a Christian book. It's not written by a Christian author. Uh, John Ronson is a, a journalist from the UK that has picked up on this and found issues all around the world and, and talked about it um, with, to great note. It is an incredible read. I could not put it down. So you've been publicly shamed by John Ronson is highly recommended for anybody who is in ministry with young people uh, where those young people have a phone attached to their hand. Mm. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Malk, and again, uh, yeah, so you've been publicly shamed. We will drop details about that text um, in on the Work Experience Facebook page uh, over the coming days. It's one book I won't have to read. One book you won't have to read. Your, um, your Work Experience podcast list, uh, book list is building like this for me, and I need to read a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I only sleep three nights a week because I've got to read a book every week. It's, um, it's exhausting. If um, I turn those okay. books into TV shows, I'd be set. Excellent. Well, I mean, that's the slippery slope from Christian podcasts, isn't it, really, into TV shows and um, ultimately worldwide fame. Okay. Um, I think what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, – Suzanne, who's been um, loitering in the chat, um, as they say over on the Twitch, lurking in the chat even, um, has asked a good question here that I think taps into some of our earliest um, – comments around young adults and vocation yeah. and I wonder um, how do we, well Suzanne wonders and I, uh, I agree how do we go about offering formation for ministry and life beyond um, the church um, Richard you got any thoughts on that yeah um, I think it starts with how do people equipping people with tools with how to speak about faith you know, that kind of classic water cooler talk. I don't know, do workplaces still have water coolers? I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> how, do you, how do you stand around the water cooler or the coffee machine and talk about faith and or reflect your faith when you're talking about politics or current issues or something? I think particularly in the Uniting Church, we, we're not good at talking about faith and particularly linking that back to what's going on in the world around us. And so I think that's a good, would be a good start by forming people with skills in how to express what they believe. Yeah. Any other thoughts, panel? We've got to encourage young people to take their life online as seriously as they do offline. So that formation yeah. process that Richard just talked about that Suzanne's referring to has to then engage in the full reality of who we are. Uh, if we're going to live a life online, that needs to be as authentic as who we are when we stand face to face with our friends. Um, and the challenge that comes with that in that authenticity is how we live our lives. The things that we say, the way that we act, uh, the stuff that we do. Um, it's easy to be someone else online and uh, as much as we prepare people for how they can be engaged in ministry in their workplaces and in their life, that also has to extend into the way that they engage uh, digitally in social media and all of those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you guys, um, which, you know, when I think about that sense of vocation for our youth and young adults, this is where I believe that formation and that helping our young people understand what it means to be a follower, you know, of Jesus Christ and live out Jesus Christ. It needs to happen 
you know, even when they're in nappies, you know, and mm. our young children, teaching them or forming them, you know, how to live as lifelong Christians um, as they're growing up. Um, you know, there are government agencies who part of their HR, um, what's that word, their orientation that they have to go through. There are videos that the new employees have to watch. And there's a there's a new one that they've got out at this in one particular government agency, which talks about um, racism and talks about how to speak with those where English is a second language. They've got education on how you actually um, accept diversity within the workplace. I wonder whether that is something that we can learn as a church, right? There's always this underlying racism or this not sure how to talk to people who are different in our church. Um, and so, where am I going with this? And so for me, part of it is that sense of, again, coming back to education, about the formation um, of all people. And I guess there's things that, I guess the reason I use that government agency example is they're doing it in the workplace to help bring unity and harmony within the workplace. You know, what are other tools that we can use in the church to help bring a sense of harmony um, and unity or helping people understand a sense of diversity uh, in, in the church and how we live out our Christian faith. So that's like a little add on to the formation of, you know, ministry beyond the church. Excellent. Oh, and uh, it's always great to hear feedback from the people who asked the question. Uh, Thank you, Susie. Suzanne has um, approved your thoughts, uh, panel. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, we are moving on. Uh, lit or quit is around the corner, friends. Uh, and it's quite the list. It's quite the... We should see a real spike in views when that comes in, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Check the, um, the Twitter charts. Um, because it'll really take off. But uh, I know that's what we're all here for. Um, and my uh, Nigel, Nigel um, has, has already submitted one. Um, I sense there's a certain tone to Nigel's comment. Um, I think he may have presupposed the panel's wisdom, but uh, we'll definitely um, throw that to the lines and, and see what our thoughts on Kazoo's in podcasts. I certainly have an opinion. Um, and my vote counts for three in the case of a tiebreaker. So... Um, Friends, our next our next segment is uh, we are returning to the library for our second last time. Second last time, uh, Richard. Uh, after the uh, sound effect, do you want to um, show us what's on your library shelves? Mm -hmm. oh. Make it stop. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? Quit. I know. Quit. Um, I've actually got two, so I'm going to go through both quickly because I couldn't pick. First one is um, Say to This Mountain from Ched Myers, um, which is a little bit of a oldie but a goodie. And I'm actually using this in my young adult um, Bible study discipleship group that I run in my church. And I think it's a fantastic book um, for discipleship. It follows Mark's gospel and it pulls apart mm -hmm. ver almost verse by verse. So you kind of go through a chapter of the book and it's you you a chapter of this book and it's about half a chapter of Mark's gospel. Um, it's a fantastic exploration of the gospel um, and what that means for discipleship today. Um, so I, I think it's fantastic for particularly for young adults, Bible studies, discipleship, that kind of thing. I also wanted to give a plug to one more, um, the very good gospel by Lisa Sharon Harper. Um, very good gospel, how everything wrong can be made right. Lisa Sharon Harper is an American theologian and um, she explores this idea of right relationships. Um, it, she go, has a fantastic exploration of Genesis, the first, particularly creation in the first um, two or three chapters of Genesis, um, a really helpful way of looking at that text and looking at what that means for right relationships. Um, plus, she is an awesome theologian. Um, if you're on Twitter, give her a, a, what do you do on Twitter? Like, follow, whatever. Um, public, <laughs> tweet. public, tweet, no, yeah. Oh, um, public, 
public gospel is just um, brilliant. What she tweets is just brilliant, uh, particularly looking at American politics and what that um, means as Christians. Um, yeah, that's my plugs. That's on my bookshelf. Thanks, Richard. We will drop them yeah. in um, and we'll see if we can get um, some information about how we can write emails <laughs> to Lisa on Twitter. Um, now, uh, there's been a bit of banter around kazoos in the comments and I'm not going to give them um, the time of day, really, because as host and uh, production assistant, um, it's all I've got, really. Um, we are edging closer to Survivor spoilers. Um, Steve Malkinson um, is, is demonstrating unintentionally the great threat that is to middle-aged white men that they're being silenced um mm. so both being on the panel and commenting in the chat um <laughs> making sure that we can hear from him um hashtag I, him too hashtag him too um the uh yeah kidding i'm thanks, kidding it's thanks, not real uh, <laughs> i think i think what you might be doing is engaging irl beyond the screen you're breaking the fourth wall um mm. someone's got to do it because i'm too busy trying to press all these buttons yeah you've um, got the star trek enterprise console in front of you right yeah, there that's right um we don't have a sponsor for this show but we do thank the people at be live for inventing this software that's um made this happen and um my my buddy nigel who also happens to be my line manager and uh boss um sort of backed this idea in from our early day and um so i you know i think we're going all right we haven't burned anything down yet um and 47 comments uh mainly from steve but <laughs> and nicole's threatening to leave um don't leave don't leave don't leave um stay with it we've got um, a <laughs> We've got enough people leaving, so just don't leave. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, the, kazoo, the kazoo only has two more appearances. Um, so that's good. Uh, that's key. Next, that's key. Friends, we're going to play Lit or Quit. Mm -hmm. oh, all right. Oh, my God. Uh, this is an educational show, friends. And uh, here, what we offer is experts opinions on uh issues and uh fads on elements of pop culture and the way it works is our three panelists all have a buzzer they can either indicate that it's lit meaning good or quit meaning bad the origins of this game was basically that um you can't say shit on a podcast because then it uh, gets an explicit rating. So mm. the only other word that I could think of that rhymes was quit. Um, probably can't say shit on a Facebook Live video either, but here we are. Uh, lit or quit? Panelists, um, I'm going to give you a few easy ones just to make sure the buzzers work, okay? Yep. Um, you can yep. say it all at once. Um, there's three of you, so there shouldn't be a tie. Um, in the case of overwhelming disagreement, uh, we will pause the game and we will um, knuckle down. So to test your buzzers, um, finding a $20 note in an old jacket pocket, lit or lit? 100% lit. Lit. We all okay, work for the lit. church. I don't know how we had $20 in an old jacket pocket to start it, with. It was someone's Even finding $2 is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Someone paid for bowling night and we forgot to get it in. And <laughs> and paid for lunch on Saturday. Okay, so the lit buzzer works. Um, the other buzzer, uh, Tony Abbott as a special envoy to the Prime Minister for Indigenous Australians. Lit or quit? So quit. So quit. Quit. So quit. My goodness, Brayden. <laughs> I just didn't one that I knew everyone would disagree with. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Uh, how good was that comment uh, by Uncle, I think it was Uncle Ken that said they need an Abbott-proof fence. Genius. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's dive in. We know how the game works. This is what the people are, for, are here for. Um, Ready. They're wide ranging. Fried rice as a main meal. Lit or quit? Lit. 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 Ooh. Okay. Um, taking change out of the offering bag at church. Like if you put in a 20 and taking $10 out. Lit or quit? 
God, it's quick. <laughs> quick. <laughs> I just want to see someone try and get away with that. Honestly. Okay. All right. Um, shine, Jesus, shine. Little quit. Quit. It depends who he's playing. No, <laughs> he's never, 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 never does. I'm, I'm going with lit for nostalgia. Get out, programs. Richard. Get out. Get out, Richard. Um, you've got to see the next one out. Um, community <laughs> Gardens. Little quit. Lit. There's nothing wrong with it. It's lit. It's fine. Yeah, lit. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's not yeah, my thing, like but it's other people's thing. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. This is the game. Um, uh, toasted cheese sandwiches. Lit or quit? Lit. Double lit. 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 Okay, good. Good, good. Um, people still playing Pokemon Go. I'm going to say quit. Very I don't know quit. what that is. Quit. Are you yeah. serious, Carissa? Carissa I have no idea. Pause, pause, pause. <laughs> Just, oh. I've, I don't have a boy. Like, I, I've only just had a 14-month-year-old son, so I, there's no boys in my house. Lungy doesn't count. <laughs> I don't think it's a gender-specific game. I think, Very I think not. people of all genders really? play Pokemon Go. Yeah. What is it? I think, um, it's like Nerdvana. You walk around your neighborhood with your phone and uh there what's the technical word mulk there's like holographic pokemons going on in your catch them. yeah it's augmented reality so Ooh, when you get in an yeah. area where a pokemon is and you've got pokemon go open you can see it like on the footpath but it's not there uh and you right. try and catch it and then you go to a, a a gym to to take it into battle and stuff and other people physically have to be in that space so you can then well, battle their other a couple thing. of years ago yeah, yeah, that's right. That a couple of years ago. Oh. Done. People still yeah, wait. I remember. Um, Rachel yeah, Anderson has asked whether anyone actually done that. And I think that was in reference to getting change out of the offering bag. And let's just say that it's not a practice that this podcast necessarily condones. But I tried once. But, but tried once. <laughs> um, and yeah, it wasn't, wasn't well received. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Christian rap music, lit or quit? Lit. Ooh. Listen to Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg's got a good rap gospel album out. It's good. Yeah, have you heard his other stuff, Carissa? I'm just talking about his gospel album. Talking about the <laughs> hoes and the bros? Like, come on. Seriously? No, he's got a good yeah. gospel album out. Serious. Okay. I answer the question, gentlemen. Lit or quit? Yes, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm going with quit. The only rap I enjoy is Hamilton, so, you know, quit. Wow, my estimations of you have risen again, Richard. That's amazing. Um, in its day, it was lit, and we haven't seen anyone better than DC Talk, so quit. Okay, excellent. Do you know um, the album Jesus Freak is still in the Apple top 20 of, like, um, the inspirations genre? Um, Inspirational. Right so, oh. Yeah. What it's would they call the hero of one? Yeah. Um, all right. Here's uh, another fairly. So that was our first split one, actually. Uh, ah. This is listening to Snoop and uh, Malk's never listening to anything. <laughs> um, but I don't feel like I need to weigh in and be the um, final. I bit. feel like I need um, to qualify my Shine Jesus Shine comment, by the way. The United Church held on to that song. For about 15 years longer than it should have. And by held on to it, I mean played it every other week. I still really? think it's on regular rotation. Oh, it is. It should it be. It is. It's like Graham Kendrick has movies. got all of the money out of us he needs. He doesn't need any more. <laughs> the show is not sponsored by Graham Kendrick. Um, okay, there's a few more here. Um, kazoos in podcasts. Lit, lit, lit. Moving right oh, along. No. Um, no. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. And this is very uniting church, young people. The uncertainty over the future of NCYC. Lit or quit? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. The uncertainty of NCYC. Are we asking whether the uncertainty is lit or quit or whether NCYC should continue as lit or quit? Where, uh, this <laughs> one, we're asking about the uncertainty towards it. I think the uncertainty yeah. is lit because it means that people are interested and engaged and, and uh, uh, keen to connect oh. in that corporate national sense. Richard? I like that. Thanks. Yeah. 
I like that take too. Richard's not convinced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, let's remove the uh, the the first part. The future of NCYC is that lit or quit? I'm going to say lit because there's we need to really explore what it would look like if we continue. Okay. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, lit. I think it's yeah, same thing. We need to explore its future. Yeah. Yeah. In the same vein, I'm going to say quit because we need to reinvent it. We can't just roll out the same thing, even to the point of saying NCYC as the brand might continue, but it's not going to be called that. It has to be this new understanding of how we engage in ministry and what that looks like to come together. And that's what we mean in exploring, like what yeah. it will look like. It may not be NCYC, but something else. Well, that's not lit. It's lit. Because yeah. we're actually wanting to take time out to think about, you know, continuing this formation talk, formation for youth and young adults. Is a new thing based on the NCYC idea something that we should explore? That's a little quick question that should be left. Yeah. Hey, whoa. I asked the question. <laughs> you asked <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Stay in your lane. <laughs> and take Brayden out of this as host. Lit or quit? <laughs> quit. No, lit. That's good. I've got a headache. Um, I've got two more. Two more. Um, oh, look. Uh, oh. Joy has uh, added a bit of nostalgia. Yes, love it, Joy. Chat, Joy, uh, right in the muffy. That is some feels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Joy. Um, I think Aurora hoodies have replaced the Sydney Olympic volunteer jackets. You know how people just wore them <laughs> yeah. for years, and you're like, "What's that?" That's and so you see true. People in their Aurora hoodies, and we will um, see them at assembly for years to come. Yeah, yes. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I was there when. Um, two to go. Um, this one, we'll see. Uh, politicians claiming to be Christian yet locking up refugee children on Nauru. <laughs> Little quit. Quit, quit, quit man. Quit, 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 yeah, quit, 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 quit. Pretty straightforward. Um, just testing the waters. Um, and finally, and this will this will shamelessly pre- begin a plug. Nialk. The National Young Adult Leaders Conference. Okay, now uh, that's a that's a well rounded endorsement. Uh, would perhaps we might like to say a little bit more about it, Carissa Suli? Yes. So um, I was going to say Aurora 2019, but Nyak no. 2019. <laughs> no, <laughs> Nyak 2019 will be held in Adelaide from the 17th to 20th of January, and this year we're calling it Lee. Um, and the whole idea of lead is recognizing that the young adults who do come are already leaders. It is not a conference um, that is about doing 101 about the Uniting Church. It is actually an opportunity where we will be inviting those who are registering to actually lead. Uh, we do have uh, to lead different parts of the conference and we'll do the preps with them once we know who the final registrants are. Um, so there'll be spaces for some teaching, a Bible study. Bible study will be led by the Reverend Dr. Sione Javier, who's a lecturer from the Tanson Nod, but he won't be doing it alone. He will be leading Bible study with other young adults. So again, trying to um, stay in tune with this mentoring and allowing young people to lead. So you're not just going to have an older person doing the uh, teaching uh, of the word. We'll actually have a group. Um, of young adults alongside uh, Sione Javier. Um, what else is there? There will also be an opportunity where we'll learn a little bit more about uh, the stolen generation and learn a bit more about what it means to be in covenant with our first peoples um, and a reconciliation with them. And it's going to be awesome. So we need um, – maximum we can take is 120 uh, people. Um but it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. So, yeah, spread the word, everyone. We need our young adults there um, to continue this conversation of how we continue to equip them and mentor them, but also to have them lead um, and offer their leadership. There will also be spaces for time out. We are not going to come up with fun things for the young adults to do. They're young adults. They can work out for themselves what fun things they want to do. So there will be spaces for them to figure out they just want to chill out do their own thing, there'll also be opportunity for that too. So, yeah. 
And as Joy has pointed out, www.myup.org.au. Get on, guys, and register. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Richard, you've attended NIAC before. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've... Do you want to give us um, what what's your experience? Um, I probably wouldn't be exaggerating if I said life changing. In that Whoa. I yeah I know I know. Um, in that I'd always been part of the Uniting Church, um, but always just my local Uniting Church. Um, and then someone suggested I go to NIAC. I think it was twenty twelve. Yeah, twenty twelve. Um, and that was my first real experience with the wider church. Um, it was the way that I saw um, saw the Uniting Church for all that it is in its, you know, amazing different manifestations. Um, and it's the way f- through that that I got really involved in, you know, assemblies and synods and which led into ministry, which led into all of those things. And so... I cannot recommend NIAC enough. I think it is one of the best things that we do in the Uniting Church that um, resources, equips, connects young people. I mean, still awesome friends with so many people from NIAC. We may only see each other every three years in an assembly or an NCYC, but we pick up like it was yeah. yesterday that we saw each other. Um, they awesome. are awesome amazing experiences so if you're a young person or if you know young people stand yeah. up yeah yes yep yeah thank you excellent okay thank you friends um that draws to an end uh this evening's special uh, edition of lit or quit uh informative honest uh revolutionary some might say uh now we are uh we've turned the corner and um we're looking towards home but there was a question in the chat not that long ago, and I thought uh, I thought it was worth exploring. So uh, take a deep breath whilst I scroll back. Um, <laughs> oh no, it was it was uh, on one of our affiliate stations. That's right, um, and it was asked by my boss, and so I better ask it um, on his behalf. Okay. Um, Oh, and yeah, final call um, for questions. Uh, drop it in the comments section. Uh, they can be specific to the, any of these guys or all of them. Um, Nigel's wondering about uh, if I, I think this would be good if we can each, each give a practical example about how a church can welcome the gifts and perspectives of young people and. And I think we're trying to push it beyond inviting them to read the Bible uh, or collect the offering. And whilst in some places that is a, a, a role of honour, we we're not in any way dismissing that. But um, there's a sort of default. Well, back in my day, it was um, the overhead projector and sliding the piece of paper over the words. And the OHP. Them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I was a gun. I I would have no more than three lines of text and just sliding them. Right. Up. You are yes. so old. I am, man. I am <laughs> so um, old. Yes, uh, says the guy that likes Lego and Star Wars. Um, so, oh, look, I love Lego and Star Wars. Maybe we're both old. Um, mm-hmm. So, a practical example. A practical example of what? Of how we... Of how um, a church, the congregation, can actually um, support, hear, welcome... Oh, um, the gifts and contributions of young people. One really practical example. Um, I'll give it a go to start off with. Hand over a service to the young people. Um, and that doesn't mean do the Bible reading. That means do the whole thing in whatever way they can. Support them to do it. Um, don't just mm-hmm. say, right, here's the keys to the church go nuts, support them to do it, but Mm -hmm. actually show trust in your young people by giving them a service to lead um, and then turn up to the service. Yeah. Turn up. Honestly, how do do we we engage in young people in any kind of ministry? Turn up and support them. You know, whatever, whether it's they're running the service, whether they've got a special youth group night that is um, about connecting with their friends and doing stuff and they need other people to run the kitchen or to do something to help out there or whether it's um, 
there's something happening in their school life that's mm-hmm. you know vital and huge in that regard. Be engaged. Be a part of that. If there's a, a huge um, anniversary or, or something that's big happening in a young adult's life, be there. Be mm-hmm. present. Just as we, uh, for those of us that are parents, need to be present for our families and engaged with them, so too in ministry, the whole of the church can be present and involved and engaged in the life of our young people because that directly sends this message that we love you and we value you because we're here. Teresa? Oh, we lost Carissa. Controversial. Uh, yeah, look, sometimes you've got to dump the guests for their foul language. Who would have uh, that known that Deirdre had such great hacking skills? <laughs> That's right. Um, Carissa's uh, reconnecting. I can see her in the lobby. Um, and I think we can welcome her back now because... Um, Pretend like she never left. That's right. That's I'll right. edit that out. This isn't live. No one will notice. Carry on, Carissa. <laughs> okay. So in the United Church, we have 12 national conferences, um, and they are an opportunity for those of same cultures to meet and network and support and resource each other in their own language. I have been part of the Tonga National Conference for 16 years, and of those 15 years, I have been participating, not connected to any role of the church, but except as myself or as a minister of the United Church. Because the Tongans actually are a hierarchical culture, often a lot of Tongan communities are led by first gen and often second gen have to negotiate their space. Cut a whole long story short, 10 years ago, it took a first gen to say, we want to really invest our time into um, our next generation. So over the last 10 years, the Tongan National Conference has actually given space for the youth and young adults and also young adults who have young families to provide their leadership by planning um, programs to run the Tongan National Conference for these specific age groups. That is a practical example where the first gen and the adults have actually stepped aside and said, okay, young people, you want to offer your leadership or we see some gifts and skills in you, run the show. Um, And that has been happening now for the last uh, 11 years where young adults are actually leading programs, planning programs, working with the executive and partnership of how they too can be part of running a Tongan National Conference. The Tongan National Conference, for those of you who don't know, draw in over a thousand people for a particular weekend, congregations from all over Australia of all generations. So for me, that's a practical example where we are not just talking about encouraging young people, but actually giving them space to lead and offer their gifts and skills to the life of the church. Another one, the New Way in National Conference. They are the only national conference this year where the adults stepped away and the young people planned Mm. all of the programs, not just for young people but also the first generation too. And I can tell you the first generation were like, oh my gosh, what's, what's, what's it gonna be like this year? We're not sure. They came into the conference this year, concerned, worried if they were able to pull it off. But from what I've heard, the New National Conference, it was one of the best experiences that adults have had, seeing their young leaders leading Bible study, doing the welcoming, doing the prayers, preaching from the front. And I know Liwanga Balu, who's on one of the comments here, or viewers, she actually led the Bible study, a Tongan woman. So here they were branching out of their own culture and going into culture, inviting people from a different um, cultural background to come and lead their Bible study. So so they're practical examples that I'm seeing happening in the life of our church today. And I think the local church, synods and presbyteries can learn um, from those examples. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Uh, One or two uh, questions uh, have come through. Nicole has asked this question, and I'm going to feel this. Are we going to do another live one anytime soon? This has been great, um, with a question mark. Um, <laughs> look, uh, 
Yeah, we'll be back. This has been heaps of fun. Um, we'll probably bench these three and find some other voices. But um, look, we're the people's show. Ask and we'll deliver. Um, and it's good to be able to justify my work um, in some ways. So uh, we'll be back. Um, don't forget that you can, uh, we will be recording this uh, edited audio as an extended podcast edition um, in the coming weeks. Um, so you'll be able to hear the best bits um from our chat tonight and that's all which right. should be most of it yeah yeah it'll be it'll be five and a half minutes long um <laughs> and and don't forget that working experience podcast actually releases an, an episode every every wednesday morning uh, including tomorrow morning um which means that we need to we'll be wrapping this thing up soon so we can get tomorrow's episode out um, but, uh there's a couple more questions but it is time uh one last visit to the library that was better that wasn't as long or painful um my book uh is uh this one called how we read the bible by matt laidlaw um and, and i got this text uh not that long ago and and matt goes through eight different ways to engage the bible uh with young people and and there's no agenda behind this. There's no theological perspective other than the assumption that there is an inherent benefit in helping young people engage the biblical stories. Um, and, and Matt lays out sort of the, the eight perspectives on, on the Bible, whether they be um, how we understand it as law or is it a moral or ethical guidelines? Is it purely history? Is it a biography of Jesus? Um, however it is, and Matt lays that out. Um, and and what I think is so important is that from my perspective, a lot of our issues, a lot of uh, where we come in the clash is actually finds its roots in how we understand these sacred stories and how we interpret them and apply them and how we've learned them. And, uh, and I think one of the greatest gifts we can give is to equip young people to with confidence engage the scriptures and interrogate interrogate um their beliefs and and the beliefs they're inherited from family and the church um and to form their own uh, theologies in community so um i recommend it. it is a fairly new book it's it, it's as it's a project of fuller youth institute um and it's i i'm really enjoying it and my office has two copies so if you're in uh, melbourne and want to grab a copy? Um, you can. I think you can also buy it as one of those ebook things. So, um, Ooh, highly recommend those ebook things. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so that, that we're closing the library for tonight, and we've retired the kazoo. Um, so you can listen with um, with anxiety levels are dropping by the moment, and viewers are. We just jumped in viewers. <laughs> viewers are and we're finishing. <laughs> now, that the, um, now that the kazoo has been retired. Um, but I think this might be a really good question to finish with. Uh, Nicole, or as I'm going to say, Muggers. Muggers has been uh, faithful in the chat, um, has given up on Survivor, although she's in Adelaide, so it's not on for another six hours. Um, yes. What is one thing that gives you hope about young people in the Uniting Church? Who wants to jump? Oh, I'll leave that up there for um, our old lady to be able to read. That's right, exactly. Um, who wants to jump in first? Okay, that is the answer. We, there is nothing <laughs> that gives us hope for no, young people. I, I think for me, it's that there are so many young people that are passionate, deeply passionate about the Uniting Church. Um, there are so many young people that are passionate about the church, that are engaged in the church, that are wanting to do even more that they can in the church. Um, and so I think that gives us great hope, particularly hope for the future, that young people are deeply, deeply passionate about who we are as a UCA. Yeah, okay. I agree. Thank you. Malk, Carissa? Come on, Fife Cow. Oh, you're waiting for me. Um, what is one thing that gives me hope about young people in the UCA? For me, 
it's knowing that they do exist and they are here and they are present. It's time that we pass the mic and give them that opportunity, um, you know, to offer their gifts and skills uh, to the life of our church, um, and that they are competent young people. You know, they're so gifted and compassionate and loving, and there is a real willingness um, to be not only to be the church but to truly live out, you know, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, I'm so hopeful because I know they're here and they're willing, but it's pass the mic, man, give them that space, um, and let's encourage them uh, to continue this journey of discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I, I resonate with both what Richard and, and uh, Carissa have said as far as what gives me hope about young people. What gives me hope for young people, if I can slightly change the question, is that in the efforts of you three and other people like you that are deeply connected and, and just so drawn to uh, how the gospel lives out with young people, um, that we're starting to see the fissures and cracks in the facades that we, the church, have put up for so long that live in order or live in a way that we need to be or who we think we should be. and we've lost a little bit of touch with the anarchy and the chaos that can come in engaging young people in ministry and being involved in the life of the church. And that's really important. Order is great. We need to have that. We also need to have the ability to go with somebody saying the word Ephesians wrong when they read the Bible. We need to have the courage that a young person might one day actually try and change their 20 for a 10 um, when they put it in the plate. We need to absolutely continue to push down everything that stops uh, or might derail or um, yeah. just not encourage young people to persist in their pursuit of a relationship with Jesus. Because um, we see it all the time. And I'm absolutely drawn to people that want to see lives changed for Jesus. That's what I'm about. That's what I know all you guys are about. Uh, and what gives me hope for young people is that there are those opportunities for them to engage and be a part of. And in fact, they even lead us in some of that as well. Can I add one more thing? Of course you know, you can. what I'm also finding with young people is that the sacrifices that they will make, there are many who don't get paid well, you know, who don't have a lot of money, but are still willing, you know, to, to go out there and put themselves yeah. out on the line, being on these committees that go on forever or taking leave when really the church will be thinking about changing the way we meet to, yep. you know, accommodate the needs of these young adults who, yeah. you know, their lives are so different to, to the way that the church operates. So that word yep. sacrifice for me, that gives me hope, seeing me make those sacrifices. They're not saying, hey, look at me, look at me, but they really are making those behind the scenes sacrifices just for the gospel and because they love Jesus, you know. <laughs> So, and it's an absolute yeah. effort, isn't it, Carissa? And we have to acknowledge that that's taking yeah. place, that there are leaders and faithful people that are engaged in wanting to connect with that. Uh, and that's yeah. really important. I, I reflect on uh, yeah. the work that the Queensland Synod are doing towards this, what is it, 34th Synod in session next year, um, and how that is looking around the way. Just some subtle changes that are intentionally about connecting and engaging uh, young adults in that process, wanting them to nominate and be a congregational rep or a presbytery rep so that they can um, just be a part of that and develop in the necessary polity that we have and start to own it. That's really, really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, Survivor has finished and hence uh, more and more people are tuning in. Um, we're going to reveal, as promised, the winner not audibly, so Mulk, you can close your eyes. But if you want to know who won Survivor, I'm going to show you now. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay, Mulk, we're, we're back. We're back. Um, and right, yes, thank you. I'd be thrilled to answer Nicole's question. I know I'm the host, but, yes, I'd also thank you for the invitation. Um, what yeah. gives me hope of, is that uh, we always hear that young people are uh, – leaving the church because they're entrepreneurs, they're architects, they're activists, and they're not finding the place in the church. And and I think we've accidentally, but somehow profoundly fallen into a place where they are inheriting a church that will 
um, that has said profound things about who we want to be, has made bold decisions mm. about how we will act, but ultimately needs to be rebuilt. Um, I remember reflecting that as we turned 40 last year, or hashtag all of this is us, um, <laughs> I, what resonated with me was the uh, Jewish people wandering in the wilderness uh, for 40 years and then, then entering the promised land. And that doesn't, and by no means do I mean to discredit the work of the faithful people over the last 40 years, but I think that, that young people who, who do love their God and express that through participation in our church mm. Um, mm. Are, are inheriting and, and are being handed um, an invitation to, to innovate, like Mulk said, and to lead, as, as Carissa and Richard said, um, and that we, we have no choice but to follow there. Um, and I, I'm, I'm dreadfully excited. I've had the privilege of meeting so many people um, so many of these young people uh, across the church, and and I just, you know, I just, I'm so excited about where we're heading. Um, AJ Mercer, welcome. Uh, a couple of great words of wisdom down there, um, and uh, Susie Castle as well, welcome. Um, now we are wrapping up here, which is uh, just terrific. Uh, we've timed that well, but this video sure. will. Uh, will uh, be available, I guess, once it's uploaded uh, this evening. And the, the audio transcript will be available uh, as a podcast through iTunes. Just search for Work Experience Podcast. Um, friends, 90 minutes. Um, what, a, what an innings. Uh, final thoughts? Final thoughts? Any shout outs? Any, um, you know, any, anyone you got to thank? Uh, do you need to put in a time in lieu form for tomorrow? Uh, anything like that before we uh, wrap up? I'd like to thank Jesus um, for allowing me to win this award. Uh, and um, I, I just I want to stop you there, Braden, because um, I think Carissa has given us the best conference um, in uh, whatever. I'm not even doing that well. Um, I, I, a big shout out to everyone that tuned in. Thank you, Braden, for organizing this. These guys are amazing, uh, Richard and Carissa. Thank you guys for sharing your wisdom in all of this. Uh, it's phenomenal. And I. Uh, I'm just so lucky to know you three, let alone a bunch of the other people that have been watching this tonight and their wisdom and your wisdom continues to shape and form me uh, as I do what God calls me to do. So thank you guys. Thanks, Malk. And likewise, you know, thank you to the panel members and to Braden and also to the viewers um, for tuning in and commenting and continuing to help us continue to think about how we can continue to support and encourage um, our next generation. And let's not stop talking about it. You know, let's continue mm. to put it into action in the various local patches or different councils of the church that we um, work in. Let's continue to remember um, the other generations um, who need to be encouraged or mentored. So thank you. And thank you, Vic Taz. Yeah. Richard. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. To, it's been awesome to be on this and to share the panel with um, these amazing, amazing practitioners in ministry. Um, but also with all of you guys, I've seen the comments coming through. Let's keep this yeah. conversation going. Um, yeah. There is so much wisdom out there. Um, there is so much learning out there. There are so many other voices that need to be heard. So let's keep this conversation going in whatever ways we can, in whatever circles we have. Um, to Definitely. continue to resource, to care for and to support young people who are doing ministry and who are part or coming into our church. And thank you, Braden, for this space. Um, Work Experience Podcast is just fantastic, providing a voice to some of this, so thank you. Awesome. Oh, you're, very, you're very welcome. And, um, and so I, I get the final word, um, which I should really mute you guys, but uh, I won't. It's a trust thing. Um, I hit these guys up uh, via message saying, hey, want to do a thing that we kind of haven't done before? Um, and, and they all said yes. And, um, and yeah, to the guys who have tuned in comments and, you know, reactions, yeah. it's been great. Um, this would have been great if it was just the four of us, but the fact that a few of you have tuned in um, has been really worthwhile. Uh, down the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a work experience podcast at gmail.com. Um, we, I would... That comes to me, spoilers. Um, 
but we would love to hear some feedback or um, suggestions on where we should take this. Um, it'd be good to know that it wasn't just us yelling into the wind. Um, but I also want to say that currently at least three states are advertising resourcing roles for ministry with young people. Uh, New South Wales has a few. Um, there's a couple going in Vic Taz, you can come and work with me, which may or may not be an incentive. Um, and <laughs> South Australia also has a youth and young adults role going there. All, those, those are all at state levels. There are no doubt congregations are um, looking to employ people as well. But uh, if you're interested, I can hook you up um, with those information via the, um, if you just send me an email uh, to that address, um, I can reply with the relevant information. We'd love to hear from you. Um, make sure that you do uh, subscribe, rate, review the podcast via iTunes uh, to stay in touch with the conversation. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, that ends the broadcast. If you've tuned in late, I'm really sorry. Um, but if you find time, go back because there was some gold stuff at the beginning, uh, particularly a rousing endorsement for kazoos. Um, <laughs> but some great chat around good news, no. around challenges for the church. Uh, the library books will all be posted in the Facebook page, but just great. Thanks again to Mulk, Richard, and Carissa. This has been WXP Live. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Brayden. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks.